And you were trying to figure out, like, is my name on there? And so I could put it on my bike. And I grew up as Chad. There was, there was never a, a, a Chad license plate. So I always felt like I ah, kind of got off on that. So, um, but when I got ordained, I looked through the, uh, the list of uh, feasts and fasts, and there's a Bishop Chad. So I was like, woo, okay, I made up for that. And so I started to read it. And what's really interesting is about this bishop and how he lived his life. So he was in England, he would walk around from village to village, uh, but often uh, he would find out his sore feet or the hardship of walking, and the king was concerned about his health, so he gave him a horse, uh, and his best horse, to travel between the towns. Well, this made Bishop Chad very uncomfortable. He didn't like being on a big horse, on a high horse. <laughs> and so he would get, you know, he would walk his horse, and the king got more mad and said you have to ride this horse so he would get off the horse before he walked into the town and then he'd walk into the town and what I loved about that is that he really wanted to be with his people um, that to eye to eye with the people that characteristic really is at the heart of I think my ministry my what I aspire to uh, to be with people we have four distinct orders of ministry we often elevate the bishop into some kind of you know big we are all doing what we need to do so the body of Christ can thrive. I love that sense of humility, of just being with each other, learning from each other no matter what's going on and where, where, what we're doing so that we can grow together in this a wonderful vocation of being the church. So Bishop Chad was my hero. Thank you. And the second question, what has been your experience in, with using community organizing tools to seek ways to engage and minister with people outside the walls of the church and would you encourage ECR to further embrace community organizing? Okay, wonderful. So community organizing is awesome. Excellent, excellent tool. Uh, community organizing, for those that are unfamiliar with it, is if you're doing a sermon as a community, you, do, you ask yourself or seek to know what is the self-interest of the group, and then you go out and try to meet that need or find a way to express that. My experience with community organizing happened in my last parish. I arrived, I was about there for six months. I was part of a rotating shelter program before in my last parish. I wanted to start us getting engaged in the homeless ministry there in San Mateo. I received a call that afternoon from our speaker saying, I'm not gonna be able to come and speak to your outreach committee. Uh, and I said, why? Said, because the city council is about to pass an ordinance that would prohibit churches and synagogues from being able to house homeless families. Wow. I thought, wow, okay. So I need to go and share my experience. And when I did, it really sort of said, look, this is all about, my experience is all about the community taking care of the, its vulnerable poor. I mean, to really, in a direct way, offer the space that they have to do this. They heard that, tabled the, the uh, recommendation, the ordinance, and then I called Peninsula Interfaith Action. That was our local community organizing group. Together, we put pressure individually on city council members to eventually overturn that proposed ordinance. Um, and then that gave me the green light to be able to start, which was the Interfaith Hospitality Network of San Mateo County. And now it's hope, Home and Hope. Uh, it has 33 congregations that are involved in it. It's thriving. Um, and you know, despite its rough beginnings, it's the darling child of, of what's there. Uh, the cities all celebrate that. Just so you know the feeling tone that was behind that ordinance. Uh, Richard Allen Davis was a homeless man who abducted Polly Class. Uh, Richard Allen Davis spent time in the San Mateo shelter that was gonna come and speak at my church. So a citizens review committee got together and their recommendation was to move all shelters to commercially zoned areas and not to put them in neighborhoods from a safety concern piece. So that was what we were trying to overturn. Uh, but we can show that we were doing this in a responsible way, 
They would be in our care whenever they were in the community, and it really was about taking care of those who are most vulnerable. Uh, we got the green light for that. So yes, big fan of community organizing. It's been successful. I think we should continue in that. I'm curious about adding to our own toolkit to go out and make further uh, um, growth in terms of outreach in the wider community. And um, what I'm thinking about in particular is something called social entrepreneurship. Uh, so if you have a spectrum of, a, of our different actions that we can do as a community to make a difference in the wider community, we could say one action might be social service. I'm offering food for the hungry. We're providing safe park for those that need to park their cars at our parking lot overnight. That's taking care of a need that the system is creating. Social justice would be about creating, uh, looking at the system which is creating that symptom that we want to change. Social entrepreneurship is about looking at both the need and the system and wanting to change it for something to happen. The Miller Center at Santa Clara, which is, I've been interacting with with Faith and Innovation, is really about creating social entrepreneurship and expressing it in the wider community. Would love to see us partner with them to find ways in which we can create further change. An example is Grameen Bank in India, which started micro-lending uh, in order to empower the poor. Right? A remarkable example. They aren't going to happen overnight, but wouldn't it be great to work at all those different levels to further make just a great, great um, impact in the wider community as a church uh, and to share our blessings with them. Thank you. Next question. As bishop, what would you do to address shrinking aging congregations that are moving toward unsustainability? Okay, thank you. So the first thing that I would do is love them. Mm -hmm. I think when we are feeling bad about ourselves, we are going to isolate ourselves. Uh, I think we need to just claim that when two or three are gathered together, I'm in the midst, God is in the midst of that. And uh, that was the story I shared with you about my start in ordained ministry. So I think a lot happens when we establish that loving relationship. Um, you know, I would want to affirm that no matter the size of the community, there's a vital, vital ministry that's going on. The second is that I would say, if we can get there, is to say, what is the invitation of the Spirit at this moment in the life of this community? What is God calling this particular community uh, to be about? And then to finally say, you know, just you are part of a wider diocesan family. And the work that you're doing in discernment is going to help us to grow as a diocese. And then lastly, what I would want to do is I would want to invite them to consider what is the vision for their uh, community at this particular moment in their time? What are they resonating with? What is that big vision that, that God has called them into? And the way in which I would want to reference that is I would want to say to us as a um, diocese, we have a vision that we, it's great. It's a, we are a resilient, dynamic gospel presence in a rapidly changing world. That's an awesome statement, but I'm not sure what it means. Like, Katie, what does that mean to you? You know, I mean, what I'm thinking about is like that story of Ezekiel and the dry bones. Do you remember that story? So it's a field of dry bones, and I see our vision as having potential, but there's not a lot of flesh on it. There's not a lot of stories on it. I'm not sure what it means. Uh, the values in our strategic plan of being Christ-centered, reconciliation, passion, integrity, and innovation, all are wonderful. But what do they mean? Michelle, what do they mean to you? Like, what's the story? What's the hook for you? How do they feed and inspire your ministry? As bishop, I would want to be going around throughout the diocese and asking these kinds of questions. So together, we begin to form our shape of what... What does it mean to be the Diocese of El Camino Real at this particular moment, at this particular time? In places where I have done this before, in the last two congregations, there's a moment in the life of that community when it just clicks around purpose, and the spirit is allowed to move and flow. It is a great and awesome moment. If we can model that as a diocese, I think we can look at our congregations who are feeling not so great because of whatever circumstances they're in, to be called in that same discernment work with us. So together we are all finding our place in God's unfolding story. Think about a moment in your life when you have had grace flow, when you know that God has worked directly through you to someone else. It is an awesome experience. That's what I want us to feel as a diocese. That's what I want all of our congregations, big or small, 
gatherings large or small, to know that God has called you to be a means of grace for someone else. Thank you. Next question. What might be your vision of working with a council of deacons rather than an archdeacon? And what is your vision of how the diaconate and ECR might develop and expand? Great. Thank you. So I'm a relational person, and I hadn't thought about how we coordinate the ministry of the diaconate in our diocese before this question. I was like, archdeacon sounds good to me, but a council of deacons, would that, that you get a lot more input into that? I think there's some advantage to that. I would want to explore that. To me, I, th I think the diaconate in our diocese is one of the most underutilized ministries or vocations of our diocese at this particular moment. And I think in large part across the church, it's, un it's misunderstood. We think about the diaconate in relationship to the priesthood. We say deacons are sub-priests, and we th say bishops are super-priests, when in fact they're four distinct orders of ministry. When you and I heard at our last diocesan convention, and I was so moved by that, it was a moment in the convention when we said, I think it was Bishop Mary or Kelsey Davis said, we are called to be the church that does not yet exist. There was something in the room that changed. We are like, that, that's something that we're leaning into. In order for us to do that, I would like to elevate the diaconate and say, that is the vocation that's going to lead us to become that church that we're seeking to become. I understand deacons as embodying the humility and servant ministry of Jesus and dwelling in the needs of the world. When I have been with somebody who's in crisis or pain, I'm having to check my own response in order to stay present and to listen to who they are and to journey with them in that hard place. I might feel anxious, I might feel sad, it might trigger my own experience, whatever that is. Deacons bring that self-awareness so that they stay there. Favorite blessing of mine, I always say it after the service, is the epiphany blessing. May Christ the Son of God be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world. That's what the deacons call us to do. We are called as church to be a witness to the humility and servant ministry of Jesus. Those who are outside of the church are looking for credible witness and sacrificial ministry so that they can trust this thing called church, be curious about the communities that sent you or our deacons, and then begin to join the communities that, that we're about. To me, the diaconate is going to save the church. That really is the vocation that's going to lead us. So I would love to see us as the Diocese of El Camino Real saying we're going out and our deacons are going to teach us how to do that. By holding up uh, that as our vision, I think more would be perhaps discern a vocation to that order of ministry. And to know that among our collective whole, uh, not only do we appreciate that, but you were our model for doing ministry as church. Thank you. Uh, your next question is a very long one. Okay. Many of our parishes have implemented and practiced open communion in which all, no matter where they are in their spiritual journey, are welcomed to receive communion. Please discuss your position on open communion. What would your directions to the di to diocesan clergy be on this issue? Okay, great. So I've been asked this question a lot. Uh, follow up the uh, cookies and coffee after afterwards. What's your stance on open communion? Uh, that's our current practice as far as I understand it. Um, I understand there's a canonical requirement re regarding baptism. I would never ever, as your bishop, ask you to check somebody whether they've been baptized before you uh, distribute communion, before you give them communion. At our last Easter service, I saw people weeping at the altar rail. I don't know who they are. I may only see them at Christmas and Easter, but there was something going on between them and God, and I would never, ever want to get in that way. To me, I think where the church needs to lean on the sacrament of the Eucharist is the hospitality side of it, because this was done for all. So in my understanding, it was done for all, not for those who just gathered in a small circle around Jesus. This was done for the entire world. So having an ethic that all are welcome here, I think, is really, really important. When you think again about that journey of those who are outside the church coming in, 
what they, I think they're, one is, well, let me go let me back up a little bit. If we think about the Pentecost story as our model for this. My understanding of the Pentecost story, there are 12 apostles in an upper room. Uh, they received the blessing of the Holy Spirit. The tongues of fire appeared on them. They were given the gift of being able to share God's love uh, in a new way, in a wise way with, with those around them. So there were more than 12 people in that upper room, as far as I know, right? Because otherwise, how, who else was listening to them as they were speaking in these new languages? So what I'm thinking about is that's our model for doing open communion and how we're going to do church. That we first are a community. The next, we discern the Spirit in our midst. And the third, as they discern the Spirit in our midst, they want to be baptized and make a commitment to that. So open communion allows us to do that, to practice that hospitality nature, to establish the community first, to invite us to experience the Holy Spirit, and then to say to somebody, please join us in making this commitment and living this out in your life. Thank you. And your final question, please tell us about your theology and practice of Christian stewardship and your views about the biblical tithe. Do you personally practice the tithe? Would you put a priority on energizing attitudes about stewardship, and how would you do this as bishop of ECR? Okay, thank you. So uh, I've always been involved in the wider diocesan stewardship work in my ordained life. Back in Southern Ohio, I chaired the Stewardship Commission. I was part of resurrecting that commission here. I think it is the place where the rubber hits the road in our spiritual life. I think it's easy to talk about lots of things with people, but as soon as you start talking about money, people get funny. It's hard. Um, I think the invitation of stewardship is simply this, that as we make a deeper commitment to God through a spiritual offering, some kind of offering, we experience a greater reality of God, and that's the, the practice as it goes. Mary and I, we embrace the tithe. That is the biblical standard. Um, that was our practice up until Olivia was born, just to be honest with you. It is something we are working to get back to. But as bishop, that's what I would be teaching. Uh, that is the biblical standard. From a spiritual uh, practice standpoint, stewardship is a spiritual practice. It is just like prayer uh, and all the other spiritual practices of the church. Um, Miroslav Volv has a quote which talks about how we are transformed through the practice of stewardship, and it is simply this. For the heart to see rightly, the hand must give generously. For the heart to see rightly, the hand must give generously. There is something about our perception that has changed when we make a step of faith and give more of ourselves to the work of God in the world. Going back to my experience in doing the rotating shelter program as an example, quite often I would talk to our volunteers and our volunteers would either host the dinner spend time with the kids and entertain them or spend the night as hosts until the morning. So there's a time commitment there. And often they would come to me and they would say, you know, Channing, I gotta tell you and be honest, I almost called you this afternoon and I said, I can't do this. There's too much going on in my life. But I'm so glad I didn't. Because what I found by just coming here, I had a conversation with this particular guest. And there was something that we exchanged that I will never, ever forget. When we make a step of commitment, when we find those places where we are resistant, or we're feeling fear, or are afraid, um, and we follow through by faith, God meets us very richly on the other side. And stewardship really gets us into following through on the invitation of the Spirit to do just that. Thank you, Channing. That was the last question. Okay. Um, Madam Timekeeper, do we have time for another question? We do. We do. Okay, there's one in the back. Hang on. Um, so you talked uh, to the um, shrinking congregations. You talked a lot about what you would do for those congregations. Um, what are some of your ideas about bringing more people into church? especially you know, adults and the people that generally aren't churched right now. Yeah. So I'm, I'll say, I'm gonna share some programmatic things quickly. So there's Invite, uh, Welcome Connect, that's a program of the National Church right now. 
Uh, Spanish one is Juntos en Misión. Uh, that's a Spanish translation of that. Very simple program. That came out of the person who was doing some clergy redevelopment work. It's out of Texas, too. It's well worth uh, every congregation exploring. Very simple way to put a programmatic newcomer committee in place. And everyone gets invite, welcome, connect, right? And so it, by its own title, uh, can help us do that. So that's first of all. Uh, second is, I'm, I'm a big fan of evangelism. I think, I, I think we should be sharing our faith, and I would want to encourage that as bishop. When we share faith with another person, something happens in that relationship which is really important. We've now brought the reality and awareness of God into that conversation. Uh, and I think there's, that we are all blessed when we have that in an open-ended way. So I would encourage all of us as Episcopalians to do just that. Lastly, there's no simple answer for this. Uh, the way that we're gonna grow the church is really one person at a time. One of the things we did recently at St. Andrews, and maybe some of you have seen this, is we created this IDIY button uh, <laughs> campaign piece, and it came out of a simple sermon that I, I um, was sharing. Uh, I spoke about the need for hope in the world, and the way in which we give hope is through someone's, I give you attention and my time. You're gonna feel more hopeful about the next moment or maybe tomorrow. If I say, you know, I'm really proud of you for what you did, and I believe in you, you're gonna feel more optimistic about tomorrow as well. So either through love or faith in you, that makes a difference. So I had the community just say, to turn to one another and say, I believe in you, and they did. And then I said, do it again, because I don't think they believed you, and they did that. Um, and so we then created these IBIY buttons, and people would gather those up and take them with them in the car. Here's what happened as a result. They would come back and tell me their stories. One couple was at a bar waiting for their table at a restaurant. There's another woman that joined them right next to them in the bar. And she um, was kind of happy and they got to talking and she got engaged that day and she was showing them their, her ring. And she, this is great. And so they asked questions, where's your fiance? Oh, he's out with his friends. Oh, he's out with his friends. And she said, yeah, I'm not sure. And the further they spoke, she wasn't sure about the relationship. And so this woman ran out to her car and grabbed one of those buttons and said, I just, I want you to know, I really believe in you that you're going to make the right decision. And my church and, and I am, we're praying for you. I mean, that was awesome. Uh, Kathy Crow uses these same buttons and at San Jose State before exam time, gives them to students as they're preparing for their exams. And she says, these students who are in the library just trying to make things happen. Suddenly someone walks up to them and says, I just wanna let you know, I believe in you and what you're doing for your life. And they say they hold it to their hearts. So I see evangelism as really what we're offering somebody is love and hope. But often we have the mistake that we're trying to convince them to believe in Jesus versus showing them the reality of Jesus. Um, so we're gonna to have to find our way into evangelizing and having a conversation together. We can, I, think we can, I think we can get there, but unfortunately it means having those conversations and that's how the gospel is gonna be shared and the church is gonna grow. Um, and so as bishop, I would say I love evangelism and I love those conversations and would like to encourage us all to have those and to learn from one another in different ways that that's, that's occurring. Great, thank you. Any other, any time left? No. Chairman, thank you very much. Hey, you're welcome, Mia. Yeah.